My name is John LaBelle. I teach architecture at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. I blog at creativitydiscourse.com, review movies from a mythological point of view at cinemadiscourse.com, and you can reach me at John LaBelle at macmac.com. And our talk today is about Islamic architecture, gems of geometry. So I'm going to very briefly say a few words about Islamic culture, that would be a whole other discussion, but just for a little bit of context, and begin by looking at uh, five great cultures of the Eurasian continent. Let's start on the left. In the west, we have the notion of the, an, the individual with an inner moral compass, and so we might think of the myths of the Arthurian romances and the story of Parsifal acting out of his own inner moral compass. In Greece, uh, also a notion of the individual, but in Greece, subject to fate. And so our figure might be Prometheus and his um, being bound to the rock by Zeus, wailing his fate. In India, identification with the infinite, and we have the notion of the Buddha and the notion that this world is uh, ephemeral and an illusion and there is a transcendent world standing behind it. In the Far East, in China and Japan, putting oneself in harmony with the flow of nature as we see in the Tao Te Ching. And in the Middle East, which we'll be looking at today, an emphasis on the society and a notion of as above, so below, that we should put ourselves in harmony with the principles of the universe and the, the instructions of the Creator as revealed in his book. And maybe the story of Job here and Job's submission, despite being abused by God, would be uh, indicative of the notions of this part of the world. So, Islam originates in the Middle East, and the desert fosters a reverence for the sky and a view of the earth as hostile. Uh, and so we have this notion of living under the firmament or the dome of the sky. They, Islam originates in nomadic sheep herding cultures. It arose out of the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad in the 7th century, and he united the uh, fiercely independent desert peoples of Arabia. Its sacred, te sacred text is the Quran, and it's logos-oriented, focusing on the mystique of numbers, geometry, and the word. And we'll see that in calligraphy. Um, and again, very briefly, founder is Muhammad, and he's seen as the last of a series of prophets. He reported revelations from God conveyed through the Archangel Gabriel that became the Koran. He was uh, persecuted in Mecca and fled to um, Medina, and that year 622 is the uh, year zero of the Islamic calendar. By the time of his death, he had united the tribes of Arabia into a single religious polity. After his death, there's a caliphate and civil wars. The Ottoman Empire spread Islam with conquest and trade right up until modern times. In the 1490s, European Christians began reversing Muslim conquests into Europe. Uh, the Ottoman era ended after World War I and the caliphate was abolished in 1924, and since then had experienced, or even before then, experienced cultural decline. So here's a map showing the influence of Islam. So the darkest blue is where 90 to 100 percent of the population is Islamic, and you can see it spreads in a band across North Africa, the Middle East, and interestingly, they were traders. So we go across India and then 
down into the Pacific Islands and, uh, and then more recently around the world. And here's a map of the Ottoman Empire. It was a major power comparable to the powers of Europe and Islam saw itself as one of the world's great powers and hasn't really gotten over the loss of this empire that came with the end of World War I. There are two types of religion, ethnic religions and world religions. An ethnic religion is for a particular group of people, Judaism, Hinduism, Shintoism. You're Shinto by being born Japanese. You don't become Shinto. A world religion is for everyone. It originated in one place, but is now widely spread. So Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam are world religions. There's what's called the five pillars of Islam. Number one, submission to Allah. Number two, praying five times a day facing Mecca. Number three, giving alms to the poor. Number four, observing the annual feast of Ramadan. And number five, try to make at least one pilgrimage to Mecca in one's lifetime. With this slide, I want to make a contrast between Islam and the West. And so on the left, we have a, a mosque, a dome, uh, and very much have a feel of being inside a dome. Imagine the, the vault of the firmament of the heavens, or the stars of the heavens, very much contained within that world. So it's a very limited world. On the right is uh, Gotha Cathedral. Inside, from the inside, we see the stained glass and we see an interpenetration of the inside and the out, the forces in the lower right of the inside coming out through the flying buttresses. So there's kind of a, a engagement with an infinite in the West as opposed to very much a confined worldview in Islam. And so here's a diagram of that on the left, uh, the earth, and then the firmament with the stars, and above that, than heaven. On the right here is a European view also of this dome of stars. But look at our figure who's breaking through. So we have this Western venturing outward and uh, breaking into the world of science. Much more contained sense in Islam. Here's a very contemporary figure. Uh, an architect, Hassan Fadi, died a few years ago very modern man, winner of the Pritzker Prize in architecture. And uh, Favi is the author of a very influential book, Architecture for the Poor, published by MIT Press. And in a manuscript he did on the mosque, he writes, in this ever-changing world of things, man is in need of relating himself to some fixed point of reference to get out of the chaos into cosmos. He has ever been seeking means to situate himself in space-time and the world of spirit and the mind. So even this very modern person, I met Hassan Fadi and he's, uh, you know, traveled the world. He's looking for something fixed to relate to, uh, not comfortable with the flux of the modern world. Our next observation about uh, Islam, and it's going to be very important to the architecture, is that Islam is anti-iconographic. So we read in the Bible that thou shalt make no graven images, and <clears throat> depictions of God are forbidden. And the reason for that is that God transcends concept. An image is a concept, so worship of an image would be idolatry, worshiping an image and not something transcendent and beyond concept. Now, in Islam, this pro prohibition can extend to all images, in some cases even TV, and uh, uh, this prohibition, of course, is often ignored in the modern world, uh, even in the ancient world, in the case of Persian miniatures, 
but <clears throat> how would you have a medical textbook with no images or any kind of textbook? Um, but anyway, traditionally Islam avoids images and instead Islamic cultures use rich abstract geometric patterns and texts from the Quran that become decorative. So this is, becomes their ornament and just as a um, footnote, notice that Judaism is quite anti-iconographic. We don't think of a great Jewish art and some forms of Protestantism are anti-iconographic and Catholicism is definitely iconographic. And on the right is Michelangelo from the Sistine Chapel ceiling depicting God. So we wouldn't have that in Islam. So here are some geometric patterns. They become extremely rich, extremely dense, and mathematically and geometrically very complex. See quite a bit of analysis can go into this and figure out how these images are being made. And now this is Roger Penrose, important modern physicist, worked on black holes with Hawking. And uh, these are called Penrose tiles. And using a lot of these Islamic principles to explore patterns in our contemporary world. So as an alternative to representational art, here's an example of a page from the Quran, and the calligraphy becomes absolutely beautiful. And this calligraphy is going to become patterns in the architecture as well. Here is a dish, um, not this one, but there's one just like it in the Metropolitan Museum in their Islamic collection. And this pattern going around the perimeter is uh, again uh, letters and this is a passage from the Quran and this is a mihrab also in the Metropolitan Museum and see on the very outer uh, perimeter is calligraphy and then across the top above the pointed arch you see these geometric patterns and they're allowed to almost look like vines and flowers but they're really not supposed to but they'll push it a little bit. The Islamic architecture that began in the Middle East tends to be mud brick architecture surfaced with glazed ceramic tile. Now, the Middle East is lacking in stone, uh, much of the Middle East, and so they build in mud brick instead. And then uh, they surface this in the important areas with glazed tile. They use egg white in the, the grouting between the tiles, making it extremely durable. And in mosques built to this day, and maybe in concrete, they'll often uh, pick up this aesthetic, having kind of brown in the back, and then elaborate tiling in the front. And now let's look at the idea of a dome, because we'll see quite a few domes, and realize that uh, initially, perhaps, domes implied something heavenly, but it can have various meanings. So on the left we have the uh, Mosque of the Shah again in Iran and the dome is of religious significance. Below that is St. Peter's, also a religious dome. But then in the upper right is Palladio's Villa Rotunda in Italy and here the dome is humanist. It's uh, depicting the centrality of the human being and the uh, place of uh, humanness and below that is the United States Capitol uh, implying government. So domes depict importance but not necessarily always the same thing. Key elements of a mosque will be minarets for the call to prayer and so on our top left this is the blue mosque in Istanbul and we see the minarets and we see a dome there so domes are not universal but uh, quite prominent. Next is a prayer hall on the upper right is the Cordoba mosque and this sea of columns and arches and now there's a notion in this uh, democratic sense of no special place 
that everybody is under God praying in the mosque. Then there is the um, Iwan, which we see on the lower left, and this is again the Mosque of the Shah. It's that flat surface with this concave element. Then the uh, Qibla or Mirab. So the Qibla is the back wall of the mosque that is facing toward Mecca, and then the Mirab is the little sort of arched indent in that. And that's where you face, because when you pray, you face Mecca. And then uh, ablution facilities washing before you go into the mosque. And there can be elaborate fountains and courtyards for that, etc. We see on the lower right. And here are some types of mosques. Hyperstyle mosque on the left, which we see in Cordoba. We just saw that. A sea of columns. A four Iwan mosque. Uh, the Great Mosque in Isfahan, which we just saw again, that's the Mosque of the Shah. And uh, those are these four elements around the courtyard. <clears throat> and then the Central Plan Mosque, we're going to see that as well with a dome. And the interesting the thing is, that the, the problem is, how do you put a round dome on a square plan? And which has an important symbolic uh, significance as well. And there's an emphasis on two axes. One is the vertical axis, and that's, of course, to Allah, skyward. And we notice the form of the um, minarets. They're slightly tapered, and they have these balconies. So look at our diagram, and on the left is a purely vertical shaft, and it'll carry our eye up, but then the eye, eye, our eye will just go down again. But by having it tapered and having these balconies, our eye is carried up, held by the balcony, carried up again, held by the balcony, bringing our eyes continually skyward. The other emphasis on the vertical axis it we see in the pointed arch or pointed dome. So in our upper diagram on the left, we see a rounded arch carries our eye up and right back down again. Whereas the pointed arch carries our eye, up, our eye up, and it keeps on going. And so the pointed arch and pointed dome are uh, important in Islam for this sky aspirant carrying our eye and our attention upward. Now the other axis is the horizontal axis to Mecca. So the mosques are oriented to Mecca by the location of the Qiblas or Mirabs and the positioning of the dome and it faces us toward Mecca and here we see the great mosque of the Shah again in Iran and architects just love this because look at this square one of the world's largest squares where camel trains would come in and then in the lower part, in the left image, in the lower part, we see totally change in direction of the mosque because that's pointed toward Mecca. And here we see the, um, uh, the plan of this on the lower right. And so now we get the whole ge geometry of how we relate these two different angles. And here we have the same thing in Louis Kahn's National Assembly Building in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And we see the plan on the left part of the plan. You see those four circles around a square. It's slightly tilted upwards. And that is uh, a mosque attached to the assembly building. And it's slightly different in orientation because it's pointed toward Mecca. And Khan uses these circles that can sort of rotate against each other to get this slight change in direction. Now, after Muhammad's death, Islam spread throughout the Mediterranean, the Middle East, India, and beyond, and became, of course, interrelated with the existing cultures where it spread. And we've got at least five typical uh, types of mosque architecture, Ottoman Turkish, Afro-Islamic, Moorish, Persian, and Mughal. So let's take a quick look at each of those. 
starting with Ottoman Turkish. And great example of that is the Blue Mosque, um, Sultan Ahmed Mosque in Istanbul. And we see just like a mountain, right? Just this um, pile of domes coming down and surrounded by these minarets, like a, a mountain rising up over the harbor. And this beautiful tiled interior. Incredible tile work. And the style comes from Hagia Sophia. So Hagia Sophia was originally built as a church uh, during the Byzantine period. And it was converted to a mosque after the Islamic conquest or Ottoman conquest. And the minarets were added at that time. And in Hagia Sophia, we see the problem of how do you put a round dome on a square base? Square symbolizes the earthly realm, round symbolizes the heavenly realm, and how do the two relate to each other? After we look at another view. So this building was originally a church, then became a mosque, and in the 1930s was converted to a museum, which it is uh, to this day. So there are two ways to put a round dome on a square base. One is pendentives and the other is squinches. So with the pendentive, uh, what you do, let's look at our gray diagram on the upper right, and we start by inscribing a large circle around our square. And the smaller circle is uh, the base of our dome. Um, when I demonstrate to this, my students, I like to start with a, um, uh, a cantaloupe. And we cut it in half, and there's our larger dome. And then slice off four sides and the top. And you get this figure in the lower left of our upper right diagram. And so now we fit it to the square, and we have a round top. And then we I get a uh, grapefruit, cut that in half, put that on top of that. And there's our spherical pendentive with our dome on our uh, base. And lower left, we see another diagram of that. And then the lower right is a diagram of how it all works in Hagia Sophia. With squinches, you fake it. So you make a square base, you put a round dome on it, and then you hope it doesn't fall down. What you do is you span across uh, the corner, and you sort of just wedge the masonry in to try to make sure you're picking up all of the dome. And on the lower right is an example of how that can become extremely elaborated and, and quite beautiful. Okay, Afro-Islamic architecture, and this is the Great Mosque of Dijin in Mali, and it's the world's largest mud brick building. And mud brick means they have to continually maintain it and replaster it. And here's another view. Moorish architecture. So, who has been to the Alhambra, the great extent example of Moorish architecture, totally stripped of uh, its rich interior magnificence, but still quite, uh, quite beautiful to this day. It's a mosque and palace fortress of the Moors in Granada on a hilly terrace. And when you come there on a very hot Spanish day, which they can get pretty hot, and you come into these paths with these fountains through evaporative cooling, the temperature can just drop 10 degrees or more. It just uh, makes it almost bearable to be in that heat. This is the patio of the lions, and this was a uh, harem richly uh, ornamented. It's now just bare halls. So this is a Mugarnas dome, a plaster ceiling in the Palace of Lions in Alhambra. And we see how the corner becomes more and more segmented and, and elaborated, and more and more segmented and elaborated to produce a, an almost infinite geometric richness. Think of uh, fractals. 
And it was even believed that a musician could come in here, play music, and leave, and it would reverberate in these crevices for some time. Also in Spain, in Cordoba, is the Great Mosque, with its <laughs> so large they dropped a, uh, after the Christian reconquest, dropped a Catholic cathedral in the middle of it, and here we have this sea of columns in the prayer hall. This is Persian architecture, perhaps the most archetypal Islamic architecture. So this is the Nagashi Jean Square in Isfahan in Iran. And so this is a great, see the, at the top of the left plan is the trail coming in for the camel trains of the traders. They came in and set up shop in the square. There's several mosques around it. And at the bottom is the Mosque of the Shah. And again, notice how its geometry changes. And so we get the rich uh, geometric play there. And in our photo on the right, we see the back is all brown uh, from originally mud brick and the uh, tiled dome. This is one of the other mosques on the square, the uh, Latfala Mosque. And here we see an Ewan, this flat surface with the concave entrance and the rich tile interior of that dome. Mosque of the Shah, again we see the geometry of that joint. Images of the mosque, 19th century watercolor of it. Mughal architecture. So what's the most famous work of Mughal architecture? Taj Mahal in India. So um, the Muslim Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan commissioned its construction as a mausoleum for his favorite wife. 22,000 workers, a beautiful marble building. So it is a tomb in the form of a mosque. And we've got our minarets and dome and Ewan. Now that we have Google Image and we can look down on anything we want, we see this fantastic plan, the gardens in front of it, with their um, four-quartered shape, fountain originating in the center and then going out in the four directions. Built on a platform, uh, very challenging footing conditions, uh, dealing with the uh, mud from the mud from the river, and it's the world's most photographed monument. Uh, the plan of the gardens, and then zooming in the plan of the building, and we see these rich plays with geometry. In fact, there I have colleagues who are geometry freaks and uh, in architecture, and they just love um, looking for golden sections. And <coughs> in fact, I have friends who are geometry freaks and they just love looking for golden sections and diagonals and, and uh, arcs uh, and proportions uh, in the Taj Mahal and other buildings like that. This is interesting. This is a section and we see if we enter it we're under the dome then we don't see the the higher dome that's for the outside so we have the second dome and then underneath where we don't go is the actual tomb. And so it's almost like you can think of it as three levels of consciousness, a heavenly realm, an earthly realm, and an underworld symbolized by this. We have a somewhat similar sense in the uh, tomb of St. Peter 
the Tempietto by Bramante in Rome with uh, one upper dome in this case, and then another domed area underneath for the tomb, realm of the unconscious, like a well reaching downward into the underworld. Looking up uh, at the dome of the Taj Mahal, and then let's look up at some other Islamic domes. Rich plays of geometry, and then the elaborate tile work. Anybody know what was wrong with that last slide? Not Islamic. This is Guarini, uh, Italian Baroque architect, and sort of shows the uh, very strong relationship between the European Baroque rich geometric explorations in relationship to the Islamic. Thank you.